Okay, so we're going on with uh, advanced Git. And if you thought that the last lecture was advanced, you should see today's lecture. Um, I had a lot of fun preparing it. We ended last lecture at merging. We, we just got into merging. I'm going to revisit the last couple of slides and then go more in depth in, in merging and then go on to more... Um, even more complicated things. Although merging is one of the things that's going to give you uh, headaches now and then in, uh, in Git and any version control system. And uh, merging is, is inherent. You, in some way, you cannot avoid it if you have concurrent development. For example, consider this scenario. So let me remind you, in these slides, we have these graphs with these blobs that mark commits in the database, in the repository. And they have an arrow pointing to the parent, the commit that came before them. Okay, so each one of these edges is a change on top of a previous, uh, previous parent. And we give them names uh, to, to be able to manipulate them. Git names them using these very long uh, hexadecimal uh, strings. Git maintains a table of references or refs. Uh, and your branches are going to be names in, those, uh, in that table pointing to various uh, nodes in this, in this graph, and there's a special reference called head that points to the current branch, and then the branch itself points to the current commit of that, uh, of that branch. Okay? Um, so on these slides, on the slides on the left of the slide, we have the situation before uh, we're making a change. And then I'm going to be writing here the, the git command that I run, and then on the right side of the slide, we'll have the, the new situation. This way you can just uh, compare them side by side. Okay, the scenario that we're in is, uh, let's say we have a shared uh, situation. We have two people, or perhaps you working on multiple things. And uh, your working directory is D, and you have just committed uh, D to the repository on top of C. So you made two commits. Uh, one of your colleagues has done some work, and when they started the work, B was the most recent version, so their change, this arrow, is on top of B. And when they committed, because they committed on top of B, they implicitly created a branch. Uh, so now you want to merge the work you've done and the work they have done. And uh, there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, the, the simplest way well, I shouldn't say the simplest. The most obvious way is, uh, is merge. Uh, what merge does, it, uh, so notice, compare these two graphs. We have D, uh, our changes, and we have E, their changes. And, uh, okay, let, I, I need to pause a second and say that I've made a change in the, <coughs> slight change in notation in the slides. Instead of using new and old, I'm using dev and fix. It doesn't really matter, but new and old, uh, were kind of confusing because sometimes I say the new commit. I don't want to use that uh, for the name of the branch. Okay, so um, and I've, I've uploaded new new slides. So dev and fix. Why in dev? Dev is a current branch, um, and dev was checked out. And we run git merge, and we name the other end of the merge uh, fix or e. It would be equivalent. So what git does says, well, I want these changes from b to d. And I want these changes from B to E. And I want them all in one place. So it's going to create one new node. And this node is going to have two parents. And this is how you recognize a merge in, uh, in, in Git. So, okay? so a branch is a node that has multiple children. And a merge is a node that has multiple parents. Uh, now, the, the way Git does this may seem like a little bit of magic. And, uh, it would all be great. Git does a lot of very complicated stuff underneath that you don't need to know about. But this stuff sometimes breaks. So sometimes Git's magic uh, doesn't work. And it's not because Git is, uh, is stupid. It's because simply it's trying to do something that it may not be um, done automatically. But let's say, let's say that it worked. Git managed to find a version of your project that includes both of these changes and these changes. But notice it does more. A merge doesn't just create a new commit in your database. It also checks it out. So F, it changed your working directory. Okay? And it advanced dev. So your current branch has advanced. So it's, it's doing quite a bit of things. 
figuring out how to put things together, make a commit, and check it out, and advance the current branch. Okay? And because of this, one of these steps sometimes is going to you know, uh, mis misbehave. What is very important is that you start a merge with no dirty work directory changes. So everything in your work directory has been committed, so it's safe. Because merge is going to clobber, perhaps, your working directory. And we've already learned, if it's in the repo, it's safe. If it's only in the working directory, you may lose it. Uh, and Git is an advance over previous version control systems that would allow you to start a merge with the dirty working directory, and sometimes you lost work. Okay, um, okay so I'm going to spend 10 minutes on how actually Git does this, because it's going to come in handy sometimes. And I, I think it's going to be illuminating to some of you, uh, even though all of you have used it before. Uh, OK, so same scenario, except I'm now kind of looking into some details of the merge. So I have three lines of a particular file, how it looks at B. B is the common ancestor before we branched out. How it looks at E, this is our um, colleague. And notice that all they did is they changed this 2 into a 3. This is part of their fix. Maybe they've done some other things. Uh, among your changes from B to D, you've changed the name of the function from F to G. There's no reason why these changes shouldn't be able to work together. He fixed the way the function works. You change this name. It looks like orthogonal changes. How does Git figure this out? Because Git doesn't know C or whatever programming language this is. <coughs> Okay? And this is actually quite surprising that it works. Uh, I'm sure that when, when version control was invented, most people have predicted that this is not going to work uh, for an arbitrary language. Okay, so the way it works is, first, Git goes and says, well, I'm at dev, and I need to merge fix. Let's find the common ancestor. So it goes, traverses the graph, and it finds the common ancestor B. Uh, then it computes the changes from B to the current branch, Actually, let's say from B to E, the, the change it needs to merge, B to fix. And uh, the change is, and Git has an internal representation for changes like this. Replace line 21 in file foo with, and this is a new line. So Git works at line-based, essentially. Not character-based, but <coughs> line-based. Uh, two pieces of notation I'm introducing now here. Um, when I'm using this kind of notation, B, E, I'm referring to the change to go from B to E. So it's essentially this edge. And I'm also graphically going to be labeling this, uh, these edges, uh, in this case with a red triangle. And I'll use different symbols to keep track of changes. It's going to be important. OK, so Git found common ancestor, computes one set of changes. And then, as you might guess, it, com it takes these changes and replaces them on top of D. Essentially, it takes this, replace line 21 with this replacement, and tries to apply that recipe on top of D. And it actually works. It takes D, lays, takes line 21, and applies, uh, applies the, the replacement, and obtains F. And that is uh, F. And notice how I have marked here that the change from D to F is exactly this change that was taken from there and applied on top. Clear? OK, um, good. But you may ask, what about this other edge? There's another way to do the merge. Why did they choose this particular way? Let me show another way. Same scenario, exact same scenario. Find the common ancestors, same step, same B. But instead of taking the changes from B to E and applying them to D, let's take the changes from B to D. So B to D is this combination of the circle and the diamond, which it seems that from B to E, uh, from B to D, <coughs> it's replaced line 20 with the new line. This is the new change. And apply these on top of E. So you take these changes and apply them on top of E. And you obtain this edge, which is a combination of changes, the diamond and the, uh, the circle. OK? And Git does both of these alternatives. And only when they produce the same result, Git is satisfied. This is a safety check, uh, because Git knows that since it doesn't know your programming language, it may screw up when it starts to take a line from there with a line from there. 
And as a safety check, it tries it both ways. If it's the same, it will say, well, uh, it's the best I can do. Did you get this? Clear? OK. So a well-defined merge, a merge involves uh, combining two sets of changes. And the way uh, Git, or any version control system actually, decides that the merge is OK is if the changes can be applied in arbitrary order, if they commute and they produce the same result. So now, same diagram, I just want to show the commutativity. There's a lot of colors now here. This was the start of the merge, two sets of changes. One of those is actually a combination of two changes, and the other is one change. Okay? Look at this diamond that was created. It's a diamond because it has four corners. And look how it commutes. These were the original changes from B to D. They get applied on that edge. From B to E, it gets applied here. What is very important is that when you start from F and you traverse your parents, no matter which way you go towards your ancestors, you have the same set of changes. Look, triangle, diamond, circle. Diamond, circle, triangle. And since they produce the same result, all of them are included. <laughs> Yeah? Okay. So uh, this is essentially what a good merge is. Now, you all know about merge conflicts. How many of you have had merge conflicts? Almost all of you. It's part of merging. It's actually amazing that it doesn't happen more often. Uh, so here's the same scenario, but I kind of tweaked it a little bit to, uh, to induce a merge conflict. What I've done I've said that from B to D, my changes, I've actually made two changes. I've changed the name of the function into G, and I've changed this constant from 2 to 4. My colleague has probably noticed the same bug um, and changed the 4 into a 3. Now, if we apply the, the recipes that I described, like try to apply this change on top of D or these changes on top of E, depending which which of these we apply first, we end up with either 3 or 4 there. Because they don't agree on what this line should be. So if, if this change comes last, it's going to be a 3. If this change comes last, it's going to be a 4. Okay, Git notices it and says, oh, I don't understand C, but this doesn't make sense, whatever language it is. And Git aborts. Um, and this is called a merge conflict. It prints all this uh, now. Uh, stuff on the terminal, and um, in addition to printing stuff on the terminal, it actually does a lot of stuff under the hood to kind of help prepare you for, uh, for fixing this. One thing that it does, the file that actually has a conflict, Git actually does, does its best to merge most changes, because perhaps they are in different parts of the file. But for the conflicting changes, it will leave these kind of markers inside your file. And so this is a one change set, and these are the two sides that it cannot put together. Uh, this is the one that's marked head. This was your change. Um, I actually think I got these slightly off. But anyway, this one marked with head, it's your change, the change that you had, and this is the change that you're trying to merge in from the branch called fix. And it leaves that this there for you to actually uh, fix it. There, uh, what I very highly recommend at this point is for you to go to the trouble to set up a three-way merge tool on your machine, on your development machine. I use KDF3. I've used it for a few years. It's possible that something better has come up since, but it's really a very easy to use tool. Uh, on Mac, at least, you download it, you install it, and uh, then you have to tell Git uh, that you want to use this tool for merging. And uh, what you do, you invoke the command git merge tool. I didn't have this on the slide. Merge <coughs> tool. And uh, since you have already configured git on your machine to use kdf3, it's going to pop up this visual interface that is going to make it a lot easier to fix this spot. But there's other more low-tech ways uh, to, fix the, to fix the merges. For example, you may look at the changes and say, you know what? Um, our version of the file is what we want. So I want to discard 
for this particular file, I want to discard the, the, the changes on the, on the other side. You see, this is file by file you do this. Git checkout hours. Or you could say git checkout theirs. Okay, so these are easy commands to discard wholesale changes from the other side or from my side on one particular file. And you go do this for every file where you have conflict. Um, or you go into the file with your text editor and remove, let me uh, go back to the slide. Clean up this part. So remove all of these markers and pick one of these and maybe even change it into a file because maybe five is the best thing to do. Uh, whatever. But at this point, you have to understand what's going on in this code and which is the correct version. Git can't do that. Uh, or you pop up this, this git merge tool and it gives you a nice visual interface to compare and to say pick this, pick that, edit, uh, all that good stuff. How many of you have used git merge tools? Okay, so a lot of you have done merges, a lot of you have run into conflicts. Um, how many of you have used these kind of shortcuts for fixing? No? So all of you have fixed the conflict manually. Okay, well it's time to move on to more powerful tools. Um, but keep in mind, don't get scared. When a merge explodes, you relax, nothing is lost, okay? You can always run git merge abort, and you're in exactly the same state that you were before. And you can go, you know, think about what's gonna happen next. Uh, okay, this is different from other, other tools, like Subversion, which I've used for many years. Uh, you couldn't predict that you're going to run into a merge conflict because you don't know exactly what the others have changed. And when you run into it, you may actually lose work. Uh, but nothing like that with, with Git. Uh, any questions about uh, merge conflicts, merges? Yes, you one. run uh, one of those two commands at the top and then do an abort after? Yes, you can do an abort. In fact, this is what I do. I say, oh, it's a Git merge conflict. Let's fix it. Fix one, fix two. Get into another one that, oh, wow, uh, let's abort. Um, Yes, you can abort at any point. Um, so in the previous slide, where the arrows are, just to make sure, the top one is the current version, right? Yes, it's labeled head. Head is your current. This is the other branch, the okay. one in. You mentioned that uh, this file may have like different places that it merges successfully. So if you check out ours or check out theirs, would those be you know, reverted? I think the whole thing, the, oh, whole, the whole file, file. the whole okay. file. Good question. When you use merge tool, uh, it allows you to pick one by one. Pick one from here, pick this one from there. You have a lot more power, but from command line, there's not much control. Other questions? No, okay. Um, so one more thing that's very important uh, about, about merges. Uh, Git tries to do its best, but it doesn't understand your project, and it doesn't understand the programming language, okay? So uh, don't be fooled. Just because you don't have a merge conflict, it doesn't mean all is good. Uh, so what it, one thing you have to remember, the conflicts are syntactic. So the way it does it is essentially it looks at line base. If you've changed the same line on both sides of the merge, uh, it says, OK, this is a conflict. Actually, it has a little bit of tolerance. If you change adjacent lines, it may still complain. If you've changed two lines, lines that are far apart, it's going to merge them. Okay, because say, well, it's, if it's 10 lines apart, they probably are unrelated changes. Well, but it doesn't understand really what the changes are. Uh, let me walk you through uh, an example to really drive this home. Imagine that uh, in your project you have this function f with two arguments. And this is your ancestor from which both you and your colleague are trying to, uh, to work. Uh, in a refactor branch, let's say your branch, you decide to add one more argument to f. So you change the definition of f, you add in c, and you go throughout the project and find all the calls to f and add a third argument. And you compile your project and you test it and it runs. Okay? Your colleague, meanwhile, meanwhile, is working on something else in another branch and uh, he uh, or she needs to add another call to f. But he's going to add a call with two arguments because he's working on this ancestor uh, scenario. So f has two arguments. 
doesn't know that you are change, making this change to your project. So what happens? Uh, what happens when you merge? The merge program has no conflicts, right? Because you and your colleague have touched different parts of the program. They added another call to F in a part of the program where there was no call to F. So it's not involved in your changes. Okay, it is going to say this makes sense. You put it together. If this is in a language like C or Java, it's not even going to compile. Okay? If you don't have a compiler that does type checking, you're in even worse shape. You won't even know that it doesn't compile. Okay? So don't forget, merging is syntactic. It doesn't understand the semantics of your language or your project. Uh, code can still be wrong. And so many people just merge in changes. Uh, and you'll see there's many ways in Git in which you end up merging. Git pool, uh, Git rebase, these are all merges. Um, okay? So um, if you have a language with a static type checker, do at least uh, try to recompile your code after you merge. Okay? Don't commit code that doesn't even build. Um, if you use uh, Ruby or Python, run your automated tests at that point before you commit. Okay? Now, it turns out that this actually doesn't happen very often if you have good team communication. Okay? Going back to the previous scenario. A good, in a good team communication, whoever's doing refactoring would have announced, I'm refactoring function f, um, I'm going to make changes. And maybe they do the refactoring at the time when nobody is in the middle of changes, or maybe people are expecting it and they're not going to be surprised to, uh, for this to come, happen. Okay? So try not to do a lot of edits on the same file, many people at once. Okay? Uh, questions? Okay, so that's, that's it about merges. Uh, the rest you'll have to learn by uh, your own suffering. Um, okay, moving on. So merges, uh, I told you how to create branches and how to bring them together. And I warned you that merges could be problematic. Um, this has a big impact on how you actually organize your work. So Git is a tool. Uh, Git does not necessarily tell you how and when to create branches, how and when to do merges. It gives you the tool to create a branch and the tool to do a merge, but it's your team that has to decide what kind of branches are we going to be using, when do we start one, when do we merge one. Okay? And uh, this, a lot of teams have tried various strategies and have arrived at various um, various strategies for branches. I'm going to describe two uh, branching strategies. I've tried them both in real life for big projects. And uh, in my case, one worked uh, a lot better than the other. But uh, the first branching strategy that you actually find a lot of um, advice on the web to use this strategy is to for your team to set up a common branch, you call it master, or you can call it trunk. And this branch, you have a convention that you only put stuff in there that you know is good. Uh, it builds, it runs all the tests. If, uh, if the world ends tomorrow, you could release this uh, to your customers, or anyway, to your testers at least. Okay? There's no half-done uh, half stuff in there. Um, and then you do your day-to-day -day work on separate branches. And when you think you're done with the feature, you merge it into, into fun. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to this. The advantage, which is very obvious, and most people uh, point this as the reason to use, Trunk is always stable. If you have a new team member and they need to check out the project and build it and try it out, there's no point in telling them to try something that's half-baked, doesn't even compile. So check out Trunk, and you know it's actually uh, running. Furthermore, because people... It, Features are implemented independently. There's very little interference between teams. So you're not going to be bothered in the middle of your workday by a commit from another team that somehow breaks the assumptions you are making and it kind of slows you down or stops you in your work. Okay? And this is why people like it. And actually, this is why I don't like it. It's not so much that the trunk is always stable. That's actually a good thing. Uh, the little interference between developers, I think, is a false sense of security. It's actually delaying, uh, delaying the moment when you discover that there's interference. 
I prefer to have as much interference as possible. I want to know early if another team is making changes that are interfering with the changes I'm making. Maybe they are changing the backend API, and I don't know about it, and suddenly my own work slows down. But it's better now than waiting until a day before the project is due when we put things together and uh, we realize that these things don't work. Uh, if you create these branches and they go on for a week or two, and then you try to bring them together, chances are very high that of those hundreds of changes on both sides, there's going to be something that happens. Furthermore, the person who's going to put this together is going to be in a very bad situation of having to merge a change, a conflict that this change was made by uh, your colleague X and this by your colleague Y and you are Z and you don't really understand why they made this change or this change and which one is correct. It's really a, a nightmare. And I've had that experience uh, when uh, at early days at Conviva, a developer who has created their own branch to be independent, they made they changed uh, 1,300 files and they quit. Okay, before they had a chance to bring it in. So I was told, why don't you try to bring those changes in? Because there must be something good in there in all that work. Okay, yes, there was good stuff in there, but it was a monstrous change. Imagine how many conflicts there were, uh, 1,300 uh, files. And I worked for days, you know, trying to pick one by one, and at some point I said, I have no idea the code on the left or the right what they do, or which one is correct, so I just, let's pick left. And uh, <laughs> honestly, but nobody had an idea, okay? Because this person left, so, okay? So half of the change is we didn't understand fully the, the details. So I said, look, if it's really an important change, we'll figure it out. It's gonna be a bug that's gonna surface in a month, and we'll fix it, okay? And we, uh, we work like that. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> Although it's very highly recommended on, on, on the web. But perhaps you can do it if you don't delay too much the integration. This is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that you go and aggressively develop on the same uh, branch. And you can call it Trump. This is how we call it at Conviva. You can call it development. Uh, it's where everybody commits their changes and everybody checks out. And essentially, every time you commit, you're doing a little integration. Because you integrate what you have just uh, finished with what everybody else has done uh, today or yesterday. And then when you want to, but that branch is going to be in flux. Changes all the time. time. Uh, when you want to make a release, when you want to give it to, uh, to the testing team, that's when you make a branch to kind of freeze it a little bit. And then you keep on going with the development for the next uh, release. Okay, so the advantage is, is that this is really a continuous integration. Every commit is an integration. Yes, there's going to be times when you're in the middle of this thing, you commit or you check out and you realize there's a conflict or things don't work, so you're annoyed that you have to now think of why your changes don't work with the, your colleagues' changes, but it's a good thing to do this early. Because typically, these are small merges, right, as opposed to the big merge from before. And it's a merge that I, half of the merge, I know, because it's my code. I'm trying to merge with something else that's somebody else. And you go talk to them and you figure out, and uh, it's much better. Um, okay, so this is, my, this is my favorite scheme. But it's really very important <coughs> to have automated tests. Because now the chances that you're going to break not just your work, but everybody else's work uh, is a lot higher, because there's no isolation. Okay? So overall, I think this is, this is the right thing to do. I recommend that you do it, and we'll work with you to actually create automated tests that will run on your every every push to the repository. Questions? Yes. So I guess in this case, you're switching, I guess in the, in the first trunk development, you're saying the trunks are kind of our releases. Yes. And then in this case, you're switching that and saying, okay, instead we'll have branches, which will be our releases. Yes. Okay. So we have a development trunk and release branches. And before, we had a release trunk and development branches. And these are just two of the uh, alternatives. There's another one that's very popular, which if I have time, I'll cover on the board at the end, is the, the, push, uh, the pull request model for open source projects, where there's an asymmetry on who has, um, for example, you could make a contribution to the Linux kernel, but you're not going to be able to push it, to merge it in the, the main Linux. You can <coughs> propose it. 
okay? And then somebody else will take care of bringing it in. It's a little bit different model um, that I'll, I'll cover next. Actually, I may cover it at the end of the lecture. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, I'm now gonna, so this was a little uh, section about merging and then after I scared you that merging could be bad, I actually took the opportunity to talk about how you should organize branches so that you can avoid big ugly merges. But now I'm gonna go back into the uh, details of working with various git commands to achieve uh, various things. And uh, I'm gonna have a second section on uh, rewriting commits, uh, changing commits, but this time uh, having to do with branches. Do you remember what kind of rewriting of commits we've done before in, in my first such segment? More people should remember. Reset. Reset. One more. You remember how we changed the commit message? Amend. Okay. Yeah. Those are two things that are kind of fairly local. I'm going to talk about bigger ways to rewrite this graph. Okay. And next is going to be rebase. How many of you have used rebase? Okay. A few. Um, hopefully, this will be something new uh, for you here. So here's the scenario. Uh, I have a, a repository, the same initial state like for merging. My changes, their changes, and I want to combine them. So I want to combine changes like for merging. But I don't want to create this diamond in the history. I want to pretend that uh, my changes came after their changes. So I want to, I want to have a linear uh, version of the history. I'll talk some more about this several times uh, today, and this is actually something I I prefer. Just think about it. The fact that you and your developer happen to be developing in the same day this feature is irrelevant for the future of your project. It doesn't have to look like a diamond. It could the same state could be obtained if they did their change. If you serialized, if you want, the changes. They did their change, they pushed it, then I go in and make my change. It looks like a nice sequence of changes, as opposed to having to think, okay, this path versus this path, what changes, how they combine, okay? Um, but the, the key idea is still, I'm combining changes. So rebase will do this, and the com command, it's almost like a, like a merge, except I'm replacing merge with rebase. Remember before we had git, uh, merge, fix. Now I'm saying git, rebase, fix, or e, the same thing. So here's what happens. This is the state uh, on, on the right. I, uh, I'm on dev, and I need to rebase e. First, I, I find all the commits, uh, all the commits <coughs> in dev that are not in e. So I look at the graph and say, what is in, what is in d that is not in e? Well, that's c and d because uh, B is already included in E, and E obviously is included. I take these, and I replay them in order. First C, then D, on top of E. Right? I compute the diffs, and I apply them on top of E. And I end up with a new <laughs> C prime, and a new D prime, but the important thing is the changes are the same. This is the same change as that. This is the same change as that. And notice that, and then dev, gets pointed to this new D. Look at, if you do a git log, you will see a nice linear history of three changes, your two changes coming on top of your colleagues' changes. And if you think about it, if you compare this with the merge diagram, it's exactly the same state as the merge would obtain, except you, you miss, you don't have this parent from D prime to, um, uh, to D. You're missing this edge. Okay, so it achieves the same the same effect, except it uh, it keeps a linear history. Now I, I want to be pedantic a little bit. The thing that is common about this C and this C prime is that it's the same set of changes towards its parent, but the parents are different. Therefore, C prime as the contents of the directory is going to be slightly different than C, because it includes the changes that E brought in. Okay? And because of this, it's going to have a different hash number. Okay? Although sometimes we still refer it as to the commit C. This is the fix for bug 53, because you took the fix and applied it 
on a slightly different uh, state of the project. The other thing I want to point out is these commits were not lost. They're still there in the repository. It's just that you don't have a reference to them, don't have a name, because if you use dev, it points there. If you do a log, you don't see them. It just goes uh, like that. But if you decide that you screwed up, you didn't want to do this, you want to go back, there's a way to go back. And I'll, I'll get to that in a few slides. Okay? Um, again, more on why you want to avoid uh, merges, which is personally my, my preference. This is a scenario where I do two merges in a row. So <coughs> we start from A, I make this circle change, my colleague makes the, makes the triangle change, and then we merge. When we merge, notice the, the diamond uh, commutativity. This is a commit. Then I make the, the diamond, they make the heart change, and then we merge. And if you do a lot of merging, this is how your project is going to look like. A lot of merges. Furthermore, what I don't like is M1 and M2, if you look to the log, they have this kind of useless commit message saying, merging uh, commit uh, branch 5 FE. It's something not informative for uh, for what has happened there. Furthermore, if you run git log, you'll, you'll be listing seven commits. All these will be listed, because git log traverses all the parents. This is what you do with, uh, with rebase. I make a change, they make a change. And then I take their change and rebase it on top of mine. Okay? C prime is the same as M1. It's, it's triangle circle. <coughs> triangle circle. It's just missing this part. Okay? Then I make a change, they make a change. When I want to combine them, I rebase their change on top of mine. Same M2 and E are the same contents. Is heart, diamond, triangle, circle. Okay, except missing this. If I run a git log now, it lists four commits, the ones I care about, with nice messages because humans made all these as opposed to, to git. And these get lost. Uh, we don't need them anymore because we, we took everything that was useful from them. And incorporate it. Yes. So because now we're using merge instead of rebase, we also don't have to worry about merge conflicts. Is that? I think you got it the other way around. Now we're using rebase. Yeah, I was sorry, merge. Yeah, I said it the other. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We have the same issue of conflicts existing. Okay. Git will do a rebase, but we'll do the same <coughs> merge checking to make sure it's okay. Rebase is combining changes. When you combine changes, there's a potential that you combine incompatible changes. So you have the same uh, conflicts, the same git merge tool to fix it, the same kind of thing. Okay. There's no way avoiding if you and your friend make the same change to a file, somehow, somewhere, you'll have to decide which one <coughs> to pick. Yeah, the tool won't do it for you. Uh, other questions? OK. Now, rebase, uh, actually, let's, uh, let's take a break. And I don't have a puzzle. Anybody has a puzzle? Uh, anybody has done an interview recently? You haven't done interviews? Okay, I have a question about this. Ah, okay. Is there a way? Um, well, let's, let's keep the question for after the break. Okay, because okay, so now, um, back to questions about the actual uh, GIF. Yeah, so is this the case? Is there any situation that we need to use merge? I'm not sure I understand your question. Merge and rebase try to achieve similar things, combine changes. They have the same pitfalls. Uh, if you have conflicts, it's going to complain, you have to fix them. The only difference is the shape of the graph at the end. Um, I, I prefer, I, uh, Actually, let me go on, and I'll, uh, I'll come back to this with a recommendation. Um, but generally, I almost always do rebates, because I like my Git history to be clean. Um, OK, moving on. I just want to squash from it after we merge. Yeah, squash. I'll get to that. So rebates, this is just the beginning of rebates. You can we'll see what rebates can do. Um, rebates onto. And I'll, I'll get to I'll get to squashing. So same scenario, same kind of uh, goal. I want to combine uh, changes, but I want to actually do it in a little bit uh, different, in a more controlled way. If I were to do a merge of F and E, that would be okay if 
all of these changes are changes I want to keep. But maybe I have discovered that this change from B to C I don't need, or I don't need uh, for a certain release. Okay? So, but I want this change from B to E, and I want C to D and D to F. Okay? Um, this may seem contrived, but it really happens because you make changes, and then you realize that, oh, these changes, uh, let's say that this is your current development branch, and this is a release that you're preparing. And uh, they discover a bug in this release, the same bug that you fixed from here to here in, in these two. So they want these changes. But they don't want C. They don't want too much. Because this really only applies to the future version. It doesn't apply here. It doesn't make sense to apply it here. So how can you take these changes and put them on top of there? Well, rebase, rebase, really what it does, maybe it should be called replay. It, it can take commits and replay them in another place. So I can take this commit D and replay it on top, and F replay it on top. And you can do this with one command. Uh, it's the git rebase C like before, except now I say on to E. Okay, so this is, gets a little bit uh, complicated. What it does, it looks at the current branch dev and the uh, commit you're telling it to rebase. And it computes changes that exist in dev but do not exist in C. So what exists in dev but not in C? F and D. Everything else is in C. Understand this concept? What exists in F but doesn't exist in C. Essentially, what exists in F is everything you can reach back in history from F. What exists in C is everything you can reach back from C. And because F is a, is a child, essentially a, a descendant of, of C, just these two are in F but not C. I take those and I replay them on top of E. So I take uh, this diamond and replay it on top of E. I take the heart and replay it on top of D. But I skip the triangle. I don't get the triangle. If I didn't have the onto, actually, if I didn't have the onto, I would be rebasing on top, I would be rebasing on top of, um, of C. It wouldn't do, make any change. So look at now, F prime has the heart, the diamond, and the circle, uh, and then everything else. It's missing, it's missing the, the triangle. Okay? Questions? Is there a way if I only want to change from C to D? I don't even want C to F. Good question. What if I only want this one? Of course there is. Okay, one thing you should understand is I'm teaching you 10 git commands. There are 120. Okay, just so that you understand what's possible. Um, although there are things that are not possible with git, but. Um, so I want to tell you more about rebasing. This is one of the most fun uh, commands to use, and I use it a lot. It's called interactive rebase. How many of you have done interactive rebase? Nobody. Okay. Uh, so it's time to move to the next level. Uh, interactive rebase, okay, so what rebase does, it replays commands. And I showed you how to replay, you know, everything uh, in a certain range. But what if you want to replay with a lot of control? I want this one, then that one, then that one in that order. I want to combine these two into one commit, and I want to change the git message. So essentially, wholesale kind of uh, massaging of the, of the history. So you add this dash i for interactive flag to rebase, and say you have to give it a, a, a commit to rebase on. Okay. Without this flag, git rebase b, following the algorithm from before, computes what is in dev, the current branch, but and not in b. That's cdf. And replace them on top of b. So cdf, you end up in the same place. Okay, So it's no change. The moment you do a dash i, it changes because it will give you a chance to tell it how to exactly replace cdf. So what I do, uh, when I'm in this situation, and these last three commits maybe are some draft commit. Because sometimes I commit when I change from my laptop to the desktop. I commit, push, I move to the desktop, and continue my work. But these are commits I don't want to survive in the history. They have ugly messages, maybe. Um, and I want to rewrite them. I want to repackage them, perhaps, for pushing to, uh, to GitHub. So I pick the commit that's the parent of the last one I want to rewrite, so B. And I do git rebase dash ib. And here's what happens next. 
immediately get uh, pulls up an editor with a file like this for you. Uh, so the, the interactive, uh, the way Git interacts with you is fairly primitive. It just put, constructs a file and opens an editor. You modify the file with commands and save the file and Git goes and does follows your commands. And this is how the file looks. At the top, it's going to fill it in with the three commits you are replaying in the order. CDF with their IDs. And these are the command it's going to act, do. Pick, pick, pick. This is the default command replay, essentially. So if you don't do anything and you save this file, close the editor that get open, it's going to replay this, this, and this. This is the default behavior. Nothing interesting has happened. But it becomes interesting when you can start changing this set of commands. So P is uh, pick. You can change this pick into R or reward if you want Git to uh, give you a chance to change this commit message. So for example, we want to change the commit message of F. I'm going to change this pick into an R, reward. Then you can change it into a squash, which means merge to two adjacent commits, meld into previous commits. People will call it squash. Picks up, it's like squash, except you discard the commit log message. You can even run shell commands in between, perhaps run some tests between replaying. And uh, one of the most powerful things you can do, you can reorder the commits by simply reordering these lines. It's, it's going to execute this program, essentially. And these are the instructions, and these are the commits on which it acts. Okay? So what I want to do is, instead of CDF, I want... Uh, to have C plus D together. Let me go back a slide. Uh, let's say that after I make this commit F, I discover that C and D really should be one commit. There's no reason I mean, they should have been uh, different. And, uh, but they should come after uh, F. F should be at the bottom. Uh, maybe that it's important for the way I want to see history. And when you start collaborating with others on open source projects, you're going to do a lot of this. Because you do your work, and sometimes you, you don't have a clear idea of how it's going to look up. But when you're ready to share it with everybody, with the world, then you want to kind of clean it up, rearrange it, make it look nice, and rebase is going to come again. Okay? So I'm going to go and make changes to these files. I'm going to take F and move it to the first line and change it into a reward. This does two things. First, it's going to replay F first. Um, and it's going to pause and ask me for a new commit message for it. Uh, actually, it's going to open an editor with this text, the old commit message, give me a chance to edit it, save it, and then it's going to replay it. And uh, it's going to pick C, <laughs> and then it's going to squash D into C. Okay, So C and D will become one commit with the merge, uh, merge changes. And then I save this file, and this is what ends up. This is my old history. It's going to pick F, because I told it it has to be first. And then it's going to, uh, sorry, I'm missing a, a triangle here. It's going to take C, merge. Um, what's going on? Yes, it's going to take C, the triangle, merged with D, and it's going to make one commit. So if I look at history, I'm going to have one commit that combines the changes, and then a commit for F with a new commit message. And um, I do this a lot. Uh, okay, so remember I told you if it's in the repo, it's safe. So I commit very frequently, sometimes with ugly commit messages. These are just snapshots to save my work. Then when I think I'm done, I go look at what I've done and say, oh, this third commit in the middle really belongs to a separate feature. But these others, I'll merge them into one with a nice, long, explicit commit message and put it first. I do that with rebate snapshots. Questions? Go and talk. Um, OK, one more uh, way. Uh, so I think this actually, going back to your question, this kind of answers your question. Because if you do interactive rebates, you can control exactly uh, how you replay. But cherry picking is another kind of, this is a small tool. I use it uh, not as much as rebase interactive. Uh, this is handy when you want to pick one commit from the past. And you really want that change here. And it's in the middle of the thing. You can't easily rebase or merge because it's, it's in the past. So let's say that I'm in dev. And uh, this is a 
this is a release branch, let's say, and they are preparing it for release. And somebody has fixed the bug. In, on, they discovered the bug on this B version, and they fixed it. Um, okay, but, and I want that bug. I want that bug fix for my uh, for my development branch, but I don't want all the rest. I just want this bug fix. So what I want to do is I want to tell Git to take this change, the the donut, the circle, and replay it on top of this. That's called uh, Git cherry pick. You are in dev, you are here, and you say cherry pick E, which really implicitly means the, the change from E to its, uh, to its parent. So it's going to take this change and replay it there. It's going to create some E prime on top, and it's going to advance me. It's going to pretend that I've actually typed down exactly the same changes that were made here, and then commit with the same commit message. Okay. Now, be a little bit careful if you do this. Now, if you want to merge these two, there's going to be a conflict. Because whatever was changed here, it's also changed here. So when Git tries to put them together, there may be a conflict. It tries to be smart sometimes to say, oh, it's the same change, so it's OK. But um, you have to be a bit careful here. We use this uh, actually quite a bit at Conviva for moving bug fixes from the testing branches, from the release branches, into the main development trunk. OK? One more thing here uh, while we're picking cherries. Uh, there's a very useful variant of, of cherry pick. Um, and the scenario is similar to before. I still want this change. But I cherry pick takes the change, applies it, commits it to the repository and to the working directory. So it's all kind of one package. I want only to take the change and apply it to my working directory. But don't commit. Because maybe I want to build on it. Maybe I want to. Uh, combine such uh, changes. So essentially, I want the change to be applied to the working directory, but no change to the repository. So if you give that this dash n, no commit uh, option to cherry pick, it's going to apply the change only to the working directory, as if you had just typed by hand all of these changes from B3. But it's going to stop short of actually committing this to the repo. And actually, I use this quite a bit. I would I want to combine commits by hand as opposed to rebase dash i because I can do cherry pick dash n e then cherry pick dash n another one and just put them all on top of each other in the working directory and then I commit uh, at once. In fact, this is how git rebase interactive works under the hood. It does cherry picks in the order that it tells. Okay. So with this. I think that I've uh, kind of um, finished the first part of actually messing up uh, your repository, uh, really improving your repository. Um, but there's one common theme that uh, I kept pointing out. If it's in the repo, it's safe. Uh, even though rebase, amend, you've seen they kind of make changes and you lose references to the old commits. But what if? You make a change, you make a rebase, and you want to go back to where you were. Okay? And this uh, is a very, very useful uh, command that I'm going to show you. It's for finding lost commits. They're still there. You just don't have a way to name them. So one thing you should understand is that Git doesn't delete in the repo. It just creates new things, even rebasing, even amending. Amending doesn't mean rewrite the commit. It's copy the commit and make changes. The old one is still there. Uh, that's actually a lifesaver uh, occasionally. Um, but how do you find what it is? Because you didn't remember to copy down the long hexadecimal number. There's a command called git ref lock. Git keeps track in a file of all of the commits it has touched recently um, and all of the changes that it has done. So if you run git ref lock, it's going to print a couple of pages of lines like this with this kind of numbers and some idea of what you've done. Uh, so this was a reset. I've done a bunch of resets. You'll see rebases here. I can rebase dash i. I told you I use it. Uh, the branches that used to point there. And then you have to scavenge to this list a little bit, inspired by, by these comments, to see which one it is. So you take this one and do a git show or git log, and it's going to show you, OK, this is the one I want. And then once you have its name, you can reset to it. You can rebase. You can merge. You can bring it back. Do whatever you want. So it's not lost. Uh, after a while, 
Uh, if it's in a big repo, maybe once a month, Git is going to decide that it's time for a garbage collection. And it's going to run a Git garbage collect where it's going to remove all the nodes from the graph that don't have a way to be reached from the rec table by following the pointers. Okay? I don't have a picture for that, but if I go here, after this rebase, this F, D, and C, they cannot be reached from this table by following uh, pointers. There's no name for it. B can be reached because you can reach C, D, and then you can reach B. So on a garbage collect, this will be lost. But that's actually fairly rare. Uh, questions about finding lost uh, commits? No questions? OK. So remember git ref log, or if not, search, how do I find my lost work? OK. Um, I want to show you one more thing. Uh, stashing. This is actually very useful. Remember I told you uh, so many times that uh, if it's the working directory, it might get clobbered. If it's the repo, it's safe. Well, what if you have something in the working directory uh, which is a mix of the repo state plus some changes, this kind of uh, circle. And you're not ready to commit those. You're in the middle of the work, and your colleague comes to you and says, you have to fix a bug now in this release branch because we need to release this. And what do you do with this? You know that you can't do merges, you can't do rebases, you can't do anything. You're going to lose that stuff. So Git gives us a way to actually temporarily save that stuff in the database, in the repo. It's called the stash. Uh, if you run git stash, what it will do, it will take the changes that you have in your working directory on top of the head, and it will save them as a separate branch called stash. This is a fixed name in, in Git. It's not a name you choose. Uh, so notice how F is stored in the repo. But you're still pointing to D, uh, and your branch is still pointing to D. So this is like a separate branch. It reverts your working directory to the last checked out thing. So now you're clean. Now you can do merges. You can switch branches to E. You can do some work in E. And then there's a way to recover these changes. Okay, git stash saves. And you can do multiple stashes. They're going to be pushing on top of each other like a stack. Um, how do you reuse them? Okay, so the scenario here is the following. You were at D, like on the previous slide, and you stashed your work. And you created this F that's pointed to by the reference called stash. Then you did some more work, or somebody else did work on top of D and committed G. Okay? So then, and you want to recover this change. You want to continue your work. But what I want to point out is that what you stashed is not only a snapshot of your project. You really stashed changes that you had outstanding in your directory. And you can apply those changes on another part of the directory, on, on, on the repository. So notice you're not going to apply them to D. You're going to apply them to G. So if I run the command git stash pop, it's going to take the first thing, the top, the last thing you stash, this circle, and it's going to apply it to the working directory. Okay? So it takes these changes and pretends you just typed them again, on top of whatever is now in the working directory. And this gets the reference stash now doesn't point to anything anymore. You used up your stash. So stashes you push when you do git stash. And you pop. You use up when you run git pop. Um, and now you continue working uh, with on your changes. And once you're done, you commit them. Okay. Have you used stash before? Uh, you don't have to use stash. Um, uh, you will have to use stash because uh, if you really need to make something, make some changes, and you're not ready to commit your work, it's the only way to save your work. But what I want you to remember is what you're saving. When you, when you recover a stash, you're not recovering F. You're not, your working directory doesn't become identical to what it was when you stashed. What you're recovering is changes you had outstanding to play them up on your working directory. So it's actually a lot more powerful. Because I don't want to get back to F. I want to get back to G plus my changes. Yes? Uh, on the left hand side, if I change something in the working directory and then I stash again. Oh, sorry. Yes? If, if I change something in the direct working directory 
and you stash and again. That stash again, what would happen? It's creating another stash uh, of another change because a stash figures out what have you changed. It's the same as git diff. Take that diff and saves it. Okay, so it's going to save another uh, another stash here, parent it on your current head. And they all call the name stash. No, and here's where I'm lying a little bit to you. Stash is not the real name. It's a list. It's a stack. If you run git stash list, it's going to list all of them. So there's room here for more stashes. And remember the last one you've done, the order in which you've done them. Git pop takes the last one you've done. This is getting into you know, more advanced stuff than I want to. So. OK, now what kind of running out of uh, time? And I have a lot more stuff. But I will. Um, one thing we will do, we'll have discussion sections next week. And uh, I will ask the GSIs to, to cover uh, some of these slides and answer your questions. But let's, let's look some, uh, uh, for five minutes at uh, distributed workflow. Because uh, but if you understand the way Git works locally, there's only one more thing to understand in terms of interaction with the, with the remote. So imagine that you have this remote uh, repo on GitHub, let's say, with two branches, um, B, C on top of A, and you want to get started. Okay? So what you have nothing on the local repo. So what you do is you run a git clone command. You give it the URL of the remote repo. Uh, GitHub URLs, GitHub repos have HTTP URLs. But this could be simply uh, an SSH address of your friend's machine and directory where they have a git repo. So you can clone from another directory on your machine, from another machine that you can SSH to from HTTP from a lot of sources. And Look at what happens. Uh, the, the graph gets downloaded to your machine. It may take a while if it's a big repo. The red table gets created, and you have your head, and you have your dev uh, branch. By the way, here I use a dash b dev, means copy the graph and check out the current branch dev. Okay? By default, it's going to try to check out master, and master might not exist there. Uh, so dev is the current branch. That's marked by head here. and uh, it, but it also adds to your ref table the remote references. So the ref table contains now three kinds of things. The special references, head, stash. It contains your branches and tags pointed to the graph. And it contains names for your remote. Essentially, it downloaded that table in here, prefixed all the names with origin. Uh, and if you can, you can use multiple remotes. You can pull from multiple places, and it's going to have all those tables merged here. Okay? Uh, and I just downloaded these tables. So dev points to B, fix points to C. So origin dev points to B, origin fix points to C. And here's the great, you know, uh, the, the, the strike of genius in, in, in uh, Git was if you come up with these names that are um, based just on the contents, these names make sense on, uh, in a distributed setting. So the name A here means the same as there, because it's simply a hash of the content. So these two machines, all they need to communicate is these names. Uh, say, OK, I'll show you now in a slide. So now you keep working. This is the remote repo. And uh, let's say that last time you pulled, there was a dev branch at A. You made the change D, and your local branch has the best, but your remote branch is still pointing at A. And somebody has committed B and C and created a new branch fix. Last time you, you fetch stuff, you clone, you don't, didn't have the fix because it's not in your table. Okay? There's a command called a fetch that will have these two machines communicate, and they will send back and forth saying, oh, do you have, uh, do you have A? Yes, I have A. Um, do you have B or C? No. Send, send B or C to me. Uh, and essentially, it figures out very quickly exactly what needs to be sent uh, from remote to the origin. So this is called the git fetch command. And notice what it did. Uh, D was mine, so I have it. I still have it. It pulled B from the it copied B and C. It created a new fix uh, reference to point to C. And advanced origin dev, it was pointing to A. Now it points to B, because it copied that table here. Okay? So git fetch downloads stuff 
and adjust just these uh, remote references. Questions? Okay. So we're getting into um, what git clone does. Uh, really, clone is a package of commands. It does git init, creates a repository. It does git remote add origin, the, this URL. By default, it uses the name origin, but that's not the special name. You can use whatever. Then it does a git fetch, copies everything from the origin, and then does a git checkout, uh, the branch that you want. So really, git clone is, is a bunch of, of, of these things. Git clone, you only do once when you start. Afterwards, you keep doing git fetch origin. Sometimes disguised as a git pull. But I suspect most often you do git pull uh, to get changes. But really, git pull, git pull is simply a fetch plus a merge. So actually, with what I told you so far, if you bring in the merge and rebase from before, it should be no, no news. Git pull is simply does a fetch followed by a merge. Um, OK, so the scenario here is that we have uh, the same situation as before. I have my local change D. And uh, meanwhile, dev has advanced. When I do a git pull, first the graph gets copied. D and C get copied here. OK, so notice the change sets. But then pool also does a merge. Immediately after fetching, it says why. Last time, your dev branch was built on top of this ancestor uh, A. But now the origin dev has advanced to B. It's going to try to merge your changes with the remote changes. So it creates this diamond uh, merge here. And the same kind of story with commutativity, the same kind of problems with merge conflicts and fixing merges. And notice C gets copied as well, but it's not something you care about. It's just a branch on the, on the remote. And just like, remember when I told you uh, that uh, you can merge or you can rebase? Uh, there's an option uh, to do the same thing as before, except I want to sequentialize my changes, A to D, on top of their changes to the dev branch. I don't want to have this diamond. I want something like this. I want their changes and then my changes. This makes a lot of sense because I have my changes. I'm not ready to push them, to share them. But I want to update whatever everybody else has pushed to the remote and then replay my changes on top of them. So, so that I'm always at the surface. I keep making changes there and I'm always at the surface. And at some point, I push it back. Okay? So um, you end up with the same state D prime like for a merge, but you're missing this branch. Again, the same story as merge versus rebase. Um, OK, so in fact, at Conviva, we tell everybody to configure their git, to run this command once, to configure their git such that every time they do a git pull, it's a rebase. It doesn't, it doesn't use merge, it uses rebase. This way, we have a very nice linear history. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of diamonds. And it's going to be a mess to try to look at. So I need to stop here. Um, and we have um, a couple more slides about push and then push errors and how you recover from those errors. And I'm going to ask the GSIs to cover this in the discussion section. Um, although you are welcome to, to take a look at the slides as well. Okay. So uh, the other thing that you will find at the end of this slide deck, I don't have time to cover, is a small comparison between different version control systems. Big companies uh, tend not to use Git. Okay? Um, like um, Google uses uh, Perforce before. Microsoft has their own. And uh, because uh, when you get to really, really big uh, repositories, uh, Git is a little bit uh, too slow. Okay? Well, thank you very much. Uh, feedback, please. Go to the form. Kill the form. Submit.